a million bicycling. And, uh, you know, I have this affliction that I think uh, impacts a lot of us geeks. You know, I have a, a somewhat unhealthy uh, obsession with puns. So uh, if you can think of any good fish puns, uh, be sure to let me know. Uh, but, you know, none of that really matters. You can just think of, hi, I'm Scott, and I like to make things. And I think now is a really great time to be a hacker. Uh, and the reason it's a great time to be a hacker is because uh, there are a lot of great technologies and fun stuff we can now play around with. Uh, the cost of technology keeps coming down, and the capabilities of what we can do keeps going up. So there are all sorts of fun things we can play with, like uh, quadcopters or things like 3D printing, which are a great example of how Technology is kind of leveling the playing field between large organizations and companies and like individuals. So you can think of like all the Kickstarter projects you've seen that have been really interesting and like people being able to make things that other people want on a much smaller scale than what was previously possible. Uh, and then there's just kind of the fun stuff. So I found this on Hackaday. This is a device that this guy created. He actually machined it himself uh, and it is an automatic dog treat dispenser. So when he's away from home, uh, he assigned his dog an email address, and when he sends his dog an email, this thing will make some noise and dispense a treat to his dog. But it doesn't end, end right there. I don't know if you can see, there's a little bit of a, a web camera up on top there. Uh, is after it dispenses the treat to the floor, uh, it takes a picture of the dog eating the treat and then sends that back to the person who sent the original email. So there's this kind of like interaction uh, going on there. And I think it's probably the first situation where a dog would get excited about getting spam mail. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's other stuff that's just like really kind of interesting and, and creative. Uh, this, this thing is like a, a barometer basically. Uh, and on one side there's a bicycle symbol and on the other side there's a symbol for the London Tube, the subway system over there. And this guy created this in order to solve a problem that he had every morning was deciding whether he wanted to bike to work or take public transit. And so to visualize how to you know, help him make this decision, uh, the needle will move over to the bike side if uh, it collects data about, you know, if there are delays in the subway lines. Uh, so it'll tend towards the bike side. But if the forecast for that day uh, is, is likely to include precipitation, then the needle is going to move more towards the, the London tube side. So, you know, just, just lots of stuff. I think there are a lot of interesting things that uh, people can come out with, whether it's just for fun or, or for profit. I mean, we just heard uh, the other day about uh, the company that makes MakerBot just got bought for you know, quite a bit of money. So there's also quite a bit of profit potential on a lot of this too. Uh, but the point of it is the next big thing is very likely to come from you, the people in this audience, or the people who are working on a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and it's just as likely to come from you as it is from some of these other big companies, like Intel, for instance. Uh, so I think a, a lot of this uh, work is being enabled by uh, kind of commodity, low-cost, uh, embedded computer hardware. And uh, what I'm doing here is, is kind of introducing a new board, uh, another option that you have available to you when doing this innovation. Uh, this, this little fella here, his name is Splashy. He's the mascot for the Minnow Board. And the Minnow Board is, is this thing. This is a, a, a low-cost board. It's going to be uh, re retailing for $199. Uh, that includes an Intel Atom processor, and the purpose of this board is to introduce Intel architecture uh, to uh, both professional developers who want to take this and put it into a commercial product, but also kind of moving a little bit more into the space where things like Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone and BeagleBoard are uh, for people who are hobbyists or enthusiasts about this kind of thing as well. Uh, and the middle board kind of was designed with four main features in, in mind. So we, we designed it for high performance, uh, flexibility, openness, and standards. So specification-wise, uh, the, the board has a 1 gigahertz Atom CPU. It's uh, the Intel Tunnel Creek Atom processor. Uh, and the CPU includes uh, support for hyper-threading. Uh, and it even has VTX uh, for virtual hardware virtualization support, acceleration. Uh, it comes with a full gigabyte of RAM, so you can do things like uh, use higher-level programming languages or you know, run an embedded database or something like that on here. Uh, and the thing I'm really excited about is it's the first open hardware Atom platform that's out there. So what that means is the schematics, the Gerber files, and everything are going to be available for this board. Uh, so anyone can take it and create a, a custom spin of the board, uh, you know, uh, embed it into a product, and they don't have to sign any NDAs with Intel. They don't have to you know, answer to anybody. And we want to make sure that all the parts on this board, too, are going to be available 
uh, for a long term so that people can you know, continue to, to, to build things off of this. Uh, one of the ways I feel like the Minnow board is, is kind of has a lot of differentiators with some of the other boards out there is that because it's uh, an Atom x86, we take advantage of some PC standards such as PCI Express. Uh, and that means that uh, the Minnow board is going to have some pretty strong I.O. performance. We have SATA on board, and we also have Gigabit Ethernet. And both of those are powered by PCI Express, uh, whereas a lot of the other boards out there, they might just tie a 10100 NIC to a USB controller and, and call it done. This thing is going to be really great for high throughput applications like security appliances or network attack storage or, or basically anything that you, know, you can come up with that might need uh, good I.O. capabilities. Uh, I like to say that the, the board, we're trying to make it hobbyist friendly, but it also scales up to you know, more serious in, embedded applications and higher workloads. Uh, and then as an embedded board that's kind of targeted towards experimenters, we also include all the embedded uh, bus standards that you expect, so SPI, I squared C, uh, GPIO. And interestingly, the, the uh, reference design that the metal board is based on was originally designed for use in in-vehicle infotainment systems. So, you know, the, the systems that control the consoles and your cars that bring up like the GPS screens and control your, your media and so on in your car. Uh, so we also have uh, controller area network support on the board that you can make use of as well. Probably a little bit of an edge feature, but you know, you can also make use of that with this too. Uh, one of the really uh, also very hobbyist friendly things about the Minnow board is the fact that it is going to be expandable. Uh, so this beige connector on here is where you'll be able to plug in additional expansion boards onto it. We call these Minnow board lures. As you can see, we're kind of going with a fishing theme. Uh, and uh, those lures will allow you to add additional capabilities to the board, things like more embedded I.O., wireless capabilities. Um, I know uh, some companies are looking at this as like an FPGA development platform. So you can you know, put an FPGA programmer on that and make use of that. Uh, and I know one, one of the lures that we've got currently under development that I think is going to be very popular is one that ha will include uh, an AVR32 chip <laughs> on it. So you'll have uh, the computational power of the board that you can then combine with the embedded I.O. and the you know, user-friendly capabilities in our Arduino platform. So uh, lots of cool stuff going on here. Uh, the board is fairly small, and about four, four inches by four inches square. I think it's technically 4.2 inches square. Uh, and we're going to be shipping it with the Angstrom Linux uh, distribution. Uh, if you, has anybody here used Angstrom before? Okay. Uh, Angstrom is also included on like the Beagle board uh, and the BeagleBone. Uh, but it's basically, I, I think of it as like the Debian of embedded Linux distributions. There's a wide range of, of packages that have uh, you know, relevant capabilities to what you want to do with an embedded system. Uh, and it's a binary distribution that you can get started with. So they have their own versions of uh, app get for package management and things like that. Uh, the Angstrom uh, distribution is also built with uh, the Open Embedded build system, and Open Embedded is part of the Yocto project. Uh, and in fact, the original purpose of this board was to create an enablement platform that Intel could bring to conferences and events when we're teaching people about the Yocto project and uh, what they can do with embedded Linux. Uh, so that was really the, the primary motivation behind creating this board, but we're also looking at opportunities to, again, introduce it to some of the, the hobbyist market and get people who want to develop uh, commercial products uh, based on it as well. Uh, the board should be shipping in July. Uh, you can get it from some of the major electronics distributors like DigiKey, Mauser, uh, Element 14. Uh, I believe if you want to pre-order it right now, you, there is a, a page up on mauser.com uh, where you can pre-order the board. And I think we're looking at probably third week in July, although now that I've said it, there's probably something that's going to go wrong between now and then that would push that out or, or, or make it uh, an, an accurate statement. Uh, so that's, that's kind of just an overview of uh, what the Minnow Board is. And if you want to learn more, you can go to minnowboard.org. We have uh, fairly active social media channels and stuff. If you use Google+, you can follow it. And uh, I'll occasionally post things and videos and so on uh, on those uh, social media networks. So you can kind of keep up with what's going on with the board and when it, when it will be available for public distribution. So one of the things I want to do with this board is to try to get people excited and looking at possibilities of what they can do with it. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to do is, is we're trying to get into kind of this hacker maker community. Uh, and, and what I thought would be cool is if we could take the Minnow board and pair it with like a robot arm uh, and make use of computer vision in such a way that uh, it, it, 
it takes a, a subject matter that I think a lot of people think of as very complicated, which is uh, computer vision, uh, and yet simplifies it down to just doing one very simple task with computer vision uh, that you know that could be replicated by, say, a family or something, you know, a, a person working with their children to to re recreate this project. Uh, so I call this the Metaboard Fish Picker Upper, and this is a photo of it in action. This is kind of what I had running last night at the Hacker Lounge. Uh, so the, uh, the metal board is controlling this robot arm, uh, which picks up this little foam fish object, and then this is the, uh, the output uh, from a little web camera that's mounted on the bottom of the robot arm. And so the red box around it is OpenCV saying we've identified this object. Uh, so the arm kind of rotates around, scans for a fish, centers on it, reaches down, picks it up, and then moves it over to like a bowl or a plate or something like that. Uh, again, I wanted to make this kind of something simple and easily replicatable and, and fairly affordable. So one of my goals was I wanted to make sure that the additional accessories you need wouldn't really go over, say, an extra $100 investment. Uh, so I, I did find a, a robot arm. The, uh, it's called the OWI robot arm, uh, and you can get it on Amazon for 40 or 50 bucks. And then there's like a uh, little USB control module that you can get for it as well uh, that's like another $20. And then you can use that. Uh, to control it using the metal board. There are some Python uh, libraries that you can make use of to control the robot arm and to get it to, to move around and do its thing. And then, of course, uh, we're using OpenCV uh, to demonstrate uh, some autonomous robotic control. I don't know, uh, did any of you attend Peter's talk uh, earlier where he talked about uh, using, he had some Node.js bindings for OpenCV? It was a, it was a great talk. And, uh, and so th this is actually something kind of similar in, in the sense that we're making use of OpenCV to uh, control uh, you know, something in the real world. So I talked about this already. But this is just an overview of what the, uh, the arm does. But I found that when trying to get this thing to work, uh, it was not quite as simple as, as I expected it to be. So for one, I wanted to mount the, the web camera kind of like up on the grippers of the robot arm, which would kind of give me more ability to kind of move the thing around in three dimensions. But it turned out that the OWI robot arm has, is, is not especially strong. So it's rated for, I think, a 100 gram load. Uh, and I also found that uh, when, when moving the thing in close to the, uh, the fish to pick it up, that it would go out of focus in the field of view when everything was kind of, uh, kind of hard to deal with as well. Uh, now, I, I have learned that there are some web cameras you can get where you kind of have uh, software control over the, your focal uh, point for the camera. So that might be something to look into in the future. Uh, so uh, what I ended up doing to kind of embrace that constraint was I said, okay, let's see if I can just mount it to a fixed point on the robot arm along the base, and we're only really using the computer vision detection capabilities along one axis, the rotation axis of this arm. The other thing that I found a little bit difficult to deal with is that uh, the OWI robot arm, again, being so affordable, does not have uh, servo motors in it. Does anybody know what the difference is between a servo motor and just a regular DC motor? Yeah? Yeah. So basically, it's an issue of feedback. Uh, with servo motors, you can get an idea of like where in the range of motion this uh, the motor is. With, with a DC motor, it's just you move in one direction or the other. Uh, and you can't tell if you're in a condition where the motor's moved all the way through its range of motion and you're, you're damaging something. Uh, and so uh, what that meant is that there was a lot of trial and error I had to do to try to figure out just the, the standard motion of, of having the robot arm pick something up. Uh, so there were a lot of timing values. I just had to figure that out through trial and error. Uh, and so, so again, it's, it's not a, it's, it's not a, a it wasn't what I originally set out to do in the sense that I wanted the robot arm just you put the fish someplace and the thing reaches down and picks it up. Uh, one of the constraints is I have to I'm all, I can put the fish anywhere along a six inch radius from where the robot's base is, uh, so that that picking up action will go and it will pick up the fish that's six inches away, uh, and then the rotation is is what's really being done uh, controlled by the software in the OpenCV. Uh, another thing I had to deal with too, uh, this robot arm is powered by uh, some D cell batteries. And again, with, without the servo motor control to get feedback of where I am in the, the, motion, the motor's range of motion, I didn't want this to be impacted by the you know, current battery life left uh, in it. So uh, the first hackery, bit of hackery I did was to uh, take the thing and add a couple of three volt power supplies to 
to control it, and that would give me a more stable uh, source of power for the robot. And then what I have here is just kind of a close-up of where I mounted the web camera to. So I just took a couple of 3M double-sided tape strips and, and mounted the web camera to the base. Uh, I did have to take a Dremel tool and shave off just a little bit of the edges of the, the kind of, um, I guess you call it the base of the, the web camera to get it to fit in and make sure it wasn't going to come in contact as the uh, arm was moving up, up and down. Uh, and by the way, at the end of this uh, presentation, I do have a link to uh, the Metal Board's uh, GitHub site where you can actually download the code to kind of recreate this and it includes a pretty extensive readme file that goes through some of these modifications that I made. Uh, again, with the idea of I'd like to see somebody else replicate it uh, and maybe improve upon it or, you know, just, just try this out themselves as well. Uh, so OpenCV is, uh, again, it's a, kind of a standard open source computer vision library. Uh, it's uh, BSD licensed, and it was actually started by Intel uh, around 1999 or so. I believe nowadays it's maintained by a different organization. Uh, but it's a lot more than just doing things like object detection through, uh, through computer vision. You can do all sorts of stuff, motion tracking, uh, complicated image processing, taking the negative of an image, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's more than 2,500 algorithms that you can make use of in it. So it's a, we're just scratching the surface and making use of one particular feature, this object detection feature of OpenCV. Uh, OpenCV is also cross-platform. You can run it on whatever OS you want, and you can make use of it uh, using uh, C, C++, Python, or Java, or uh, if you're making use of, of Peter's um, Node.js library, you can, you can do that with some uh, object detection features as well. So how do we go about training a computer to recognize an object? Uh, this is where OpenCV makes use of some kind of machine lear learning algorithms. Uh, and this whole process is done uh, through uh, giving, feeding an algorithm a whole bunch of images that have the object that you're trying to detect, detect in it. Those are called the positive samples. Uh, and then also feeding it a bunch of negative samples, ones that don't have the object that you're trying to detect in it. And at a very abstract level, basically that algorithm needs to figure out what are the similarities uh, in the one that has the object and specifically where that object is positioned within that image. Uh, and then make sure that it's not creating false positives uh, when it's looking at those negative images. Uh, and what we, what, there are different algorithms you can use for object detection with OpenCV, but one of the ones that's fairly computationally friendly for things like embedded applications is are using hard classifiers. And hard classifiers basically stack up a series of tests that you go through uh, to detect whether the object exists or not in a particular image. And when you're looking at a video stream, you basically think of the video stream as a series of stat static images, uh, one at a time. Uh, and it's, it's set up computationally so that uh, the first test that it runs is fairly computationally easy for it to do, and if it can rule out that the object is not in that image, it'll then basically say, okay, I don't have to run any more tests. But if it thinks that there is a possibility that that image is in there, it'll run the next stage of the classifier. And you can have, a, you know, uh, you can specify the number of stages when you're training this algorithm uh, to give it increased accuracy. And as it goes on further and further, it has a higher degree of certainty that this object is in fact in this image and, you know, where it's located. Uh, so, so like I said, in, in addition to, and, and when I say you have to take a lot of image, uh, a lot of photos of the object that you're trying to detect, I mean hundreds of photos, and they recommend maybe even a thousand photos. So, and, and it's not just, it doesn't just stop at that, because, you know, it can be a little bit tedious to take all these photos of the object you're trying to detect, but you also have to use a program to bring up each of these photos, and then you can manually draw a box around them, defining what's called the region of interest to say, this is the object within this image that uh, we're trying to detect. Uh, and as you use that, uh, basically it, it just creates, uh, there's a, a utility you can use to do this called object marker. I'd say you get real comfortable when you're uh, using it because it can take a while to go through. Uh, and it, what it does is it generates a text file that has the image and the coordinates of the object that you've detected uh, within it. And then you run some additional commands to process that and turn it into a vector file that the hard training uh, utility of OpenCV can then make use of. Uh, to actually run through the, the actual algorithm itself for, for the training. So I had here uh, the idea of, of giving you some demos of what this can do, but there's actually a, a really useful utility. So if you're using a, a Linux distribution like Ubuntu, for example, uh, and you install the OpenCV packages, 
what it does include with it, if you include the development uh, package, is a, a database already for uh, detecting a face or certain features of a face. So uh, there's also a program called Face Detect that you can make use of uh, that does that. And I just thought I'd just give you a quick, uh, quick demo of it uh, in action here. Let me just set up my command line first. Because I have a web camera in this uh, computer and we can, we can take a look at it. So I'm going to move this over to here. Okay, so here's the uh, face detect program. And I can't remember if this, this is the C version. So if I say face detect and I give it the, uh, 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 where the cascade database uh, is stored of the, the uh, face features, and this is the gets included in, uh, in that package for, um, for OpenCV on your Linux distribution. Uh, you can make use of it and it'll bring this up and as you can see it doesn't identify my face yet, but if I kind of look at it, there should be a box around my face and if I turn away, of course it, it, it can't know because it needs to see, basically that, that detection is based on the fact that there is like, you know, two shadows under my eyes is one of the kind of unique features of the face. And so, if, you know, if I move it over here, I don't know if you've seen here, do you see any um, false positives? Additional little rectangles that sometimes show up in the image? Uh, yeah, sometimes just, yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's something you gotta be careful with when you're making use of this with OpenCV is you can get false positives and sometimes when you're detecting things, there can be uh, some jitter in that, uh, in that region of interest that's being detected. So, so if, I, if I sit really still, you know, you might see that the, the red box, yeah, I can't look at it right now either. Uh, is maybe shifting just a little bit. And that becomes a challenge when uh, working with something like a robot arm that you want to center in on an object because it can, you can have to worry about that jitter uh, as well. You want to stabilize that. So that's just a, a quick demo of, uh, of OpenCV uh, and its face detection. Oh, and you know what, so since, and I apologize that I don't have the robot arm with me uh, right now, but I, I did, uh, I do have a video of it I can show you, of it in action. The middle board fish picker upper. And so what we see right here, we've got the, uh, the robot arm, the middle board, the little foam fish, I think I pick it up. So I, I, the foam fish, by the way, is, is, you know, those little cozies that are used to insulate soda cans. Uh, but they're basically a piece of foam, and I cut that out and kind of curled it back on itself to make this little fish object. So you can't see it, but there's actually a couple of markings of where that six inch radius is, and I put that there. And I run the uh, metal board fish picker upper script, which again, you can find on, on GitHub. It's less than 300 lines of Python, so it's kind of a, a neat thing to, to take a look at that you can do this. And as it, the arm has been rotating, it's looking at where the, uh, the fish object is, and the robot arm is basically centering back and forth. And once, once it's happy with where it is, it'll reach down, go through the standard routine operation of picking up the fish. And we'll lift it up and then bring it over to this, uh, this bowl right here. And what you're seeing is basically the last frame that it was at when it was fully centered. So yeah, so I have plans for this demo. I want to extend it a little bit further. It's still a work in progress right now. Um, but I think I'd like to get it ready for Maker Faire New York City uh, later this year, that's in September. Uh, and one of the things I want to do is I want to uh, make use of the GPIO capabilities of the metal board uh, so that you can press a button to trigger it instead of having to like type in something on a computer screen and kind of make it behave more like a, an embedded computer would. 
Uh, the other thing uh, we can do here, so the middle board includes some, some four um, GPIO controlled switches. So we could have, say, four different colored fish that can be picked up. So once I've identified the fish and I've got the box around it, what I can do is I can ask oh, through OpenCV, I can say, what is the sum of the average colors within this box? And I can determine which color the fish is. It might be a red fish or a blue fish or a green fish or whatever. Uh, and then, uh, you know, someone can come and, and, and you know, press a button for the particular colored fish that they would like to, to see uh, get picked up. And the robot arm would then ignore the other fish and focus on the one that you, uh, that you do want to pick up. I also thought, too, trying to make the thing really family friendly and like kid friendly is, you know, the Swedish fish candies? Those things would be perfect, right? Because they come in different colors, red and yellow and green. Um, they're a little bit difficult to, to pick up, but maybe if I were to prop them up on something, that might be uh, a, a way to do it. And then, of course, you know, the, the robot arm picks up that colored fish, Swedish fish, and then you know, maybe the kid gets to, to keep it afterwards. You know, that, that would draw people to the booth, I have the feeling, you know? <laughs> Okay, so uh, one of the things I wanted to mention too was uh, how many of you are familiar with the Octo project? Okay, same person who is familiar with, uh, with Angstrom. Uh, so yeah, the Octo project is, again, one of the main reasons why we're using this board. We want people to take it uh, and experiment with the Octo project. That's uh, a, definitely a goal that we have. Uh, but we, we do, like I said, offer a binary distribution in the form of Angstrom for people who are just, just hobbyists and they just want to get something done with the board. But Yocto is, is, I call it a series of power tools for creating uh, a custom embedded Linux distribution. And you, know, you might think, well, why do you want to do that? Well, if you're a commercial company and you have a line of products, let's say they all include things like multimedia codecs, you're making media servers or things like that, it can be very handy to have your own custom Linux distribution that only includes the software that you really care about. Maybe it's, it's something you do for security reasons. You don't want to include a lot of extra cruft or you don't want to be dependent on a particular vendor uh, Yocto can be very useful for doing that. Uh, and the Yocto project is based on BitBake and the Open Embedded build system. So Open Embedded's been around for a long time uh, and it's basically kind of is part of the Yocto project umbrella right now. And Intel is very active in promoting and supporting and contributing to the Yocto project and the Open Embedded build systems and the, the BitBake build tool. Uh, and what it is, it's a system that will download all the source packages of what's going into your embedded Linux image and it compiles them from scratch. And that allows you to do all sorts of things like you have full control over the uh, you know, uh, compiler optimizations and so on that are, that are used. You think if, if, if you're a Gen 2 fan, uh, this whole stuff, this whole system is, is very much influenced by the Gen 2 build system. Um, and you can do things like, you know, you can use multi-lib stuff so you have different architecture packages on the same image. Uh, and again, it's just, it's a set of power tools that really allow you to have full control over what's going into this Linux image. Uh, and it allows you to also do things that are important in workflows, such as generate your own binary package feed that you could set up and then have uh, your devices in the field update themselves. So you push to your package feed when you know, things have been tested and ready, and then your devices can go and pull that uh, to get new updates for the system. Again, I said Intel is involved in this, but this is not like an x86 only thing. It's fully cross-platform. So x86, ARM, MIPS, and PowerPC uh, are all supported as targets. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's becoming the standard uh, way of building embedded Linux distributions. Uh, so for example, uh, OSVs like Wind River, for example, have their own custom commercial uh, embedded Linux distributions, and they are now building their stuff based on Yocto. Uh, and what that allows you to do, because Yocto is all open source, you can get started with it, uh, with your project or your product. Uh, and then if you need commercial support, you have some options available to, uh, to move into, say, you know, use Wind Rivers, the tools, and everything. Uh, and the way Yocto is architecturally designed is it, it defines software stacks as individual layers. Uh, and so the board support packages or the hardware, you know, the kernel configuration, what kind of X driver you use, and so on, is defined in that board support package. And what that means is you can also develop an application for one particular board while you're developing it. And let's say something happens in the marketplace, a new board comes out that's cheaper and more capable that you want to make use of. You take the board support package for that particular board, 
entered into your configuration, remove the one for the previous one you uh, were using, rebuild it, and it should all work. You know, so it's, it's basically a way of also allowing you to reuse a lot of the effort that you put into your, uh, uh, your embedded Linux uh, products. Uh, so you can learn more at the, uh, the Opto Project uh, website. And uh, like I said, some future plans I have for this. Um, the, the code you can see online right now is basically a big state machine for controlling that robot arm. And I know the right way of doing that is not to use global variables and you know, these different state functions. So I, I do want to refactor that to make use of uh, Python libraries that are developed, you know, designed to support state machine uh, to make it a little bit more maintainable. Um, another thing, I ran into quite a few problems with the reliability of OpenCV depending on the amount of ambient light that was in the room. So uh, I found that I actually created two different horror databases. Uh, one works really well in fairly low light conditions and one tends to work better when it's like really bright out. Uh, and I had a kind of frustrating situation fairly recently. I was in uh, Japan for LinuxCon Japan and my booth was set up like right next to this big window. It was like basically the equivalent of, of having it set up on a table right there. Uh, and of course, you know, the sun was coming out and the clouds were coming in and so what was happening was the object detection was still working, but I was getting this like weird margin of error, like the, the box being drawn around the object was, was bigger. And so the thing would go down and reach for the, uh, to pick up the fish and it would be off by just enough so that it would, it would miss it. So uh, in working with OpenCV, that's one of the kind of the frustrations you have to deal with. Um, when I talk about computer vision and some other presentations I've done too, I've also talked about uh, other ways you can do this. Uh, so the, the OpenCV stuff is really based on like having a 2D camera and just having a very flat uh, view of, of the world that you're interacting with. But there are, are tools like, so for example, the Microsoft Connect is basically a 3D scanner. It's using infrared light to kind of create like a 3D model of what it sees uh, you know, outside of it. And what's nice about it is that using that uh, infrared, it's totally independent of the light situation that you're in. Uh, so there are robotic kits you can get. There's one called the TurtleBot, which is pretty cool because uh, it uses a Microsoft Connect and kind of gives you that uh, way of approaching the whole uh, thing. And it can do things like object detection and, and so on as well. Uh, and then I talked about this. This was the, uh, the adding control of, of which fish you pick up uh, by color based on uh, GPIO buttons and so on. Uh, and then these slides, I'll get these uploaded to where they're supposed to be uploaded on the Open Source Bridge site uh, in the next day or two. Uh, and so I just have some links here for the different projects. Uh, here's a link to that OWI robot arm. Uh, to OpenCV, there's a couple of good tutorials um, I called out there too if you want to learn about that uh, as well. But basically, that's, that's the presentation. and uh, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, if, that's, if there's one question I get more than anything else, that's it. So how does this compare to the Raspberry Pi? Well, I wouldn't really consider them competitors, mainly because of price and capability. So the Raspberry Pi was very affordable uh, and, and, and cheap, and it was designed for educational purposes. Uh, it doesn't have things like you know, gigabit Ethernet or SATA or things like that that this board has. And just in terms of raw CPU performance, um, you know, you're going to find this is going to be much higher end uh, than that. One of the things I'm really excited about the Raspberry Pi, I, I have them, I, I make use of them in some projects, uh, is the fact that um, the Raspberry Pi is getting people into embedded development who never would have gotten into it before. Uh, and so this is a great thing because as people get into that and they start getting into more complicated or advanced projects, uh, additional boards like this that have other capabilities uh, can definitely become attractive too. So, you know, I think each one has its, its place and uh, I'm an enthusiastic supporter of both. Any other questions? Yeah, Russell. Have you considered putting some kind of optical encoder on the robot? When you say optical encoder, what are you referring to? Yeah, uh, any kind of encoder would give you a position. I mean, you could, you could print something on paper and potentially read you know, steps or something. So basically emulating that servo capability without actually having the servo motors. Yeah, there's different things that could be done. I suppose like micro switches could be placed in certain yeah. positions on the robot arm too. That would be a, another way of doing it. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's all sorts of possibilities to improve it. Uh, one of the things somebody pointed out that I thought was really insightful about the lighting problems that I had was, you know, what if you took a, a little light and put it kind of like where the, um, where the, uh, the web camera is so that when the thing is scanning around, it has a more consistent source of light 
that would help to equalize some of those problems, I think that was a, a really good suggestion uh, for a way of improving the, the demo. Yeah, there are these things, I forget what they're called, there's a name for them, uh, but there's their, their shape in a certain way, and they're, they're really easy for OpenCV to detect uh, kind of what, what they are. Uh, so if I could put a, like, a little label on it, it's kind of like a QR code, but it's, it's much more simplified than that. Uh, but those things are very useful when you're using OpenCV and you want to detect things. Sometimes I've seen for, uh, if you have a camera that's looking at a robot arm and you want to figure out the, what position it is, you can put them at different positions and then you can see kind of like the um, angle between them and it, it becomes very easy to create that model of what the arm is doing based on that. So. But what are you using for storage? Oh, uh, so yeah, so storage on it. So the Minnow board comes with uh, a micro SD card and this is what's going to have Angstrom on it when you buy the board. Uh, and then of course you also have uh, the SATA port on it as well. Uh, and then, you know, technically with uh, PCI Express on that lure, I know one of the lures that's going to come out will have an M SATA, so you can have those little tiny SSDs uh, on it as well. So if you want, you know, really fast disk, disk storage, you have a, a number of different options for that. Uh, enclosures are going to be coming out definitely once the board comes out. I know one person is uh, in the process of working on a design that will be uploaded to Thingverse in case you want to 3D print out your own you know, board case. I've done that for the, uh, the Beagle Bone and everything too, so we'll, we'll be doing the same thing for the, for the uh, Okay, well it's the last session of the day, so I didn't want to go over time, so thank you and I hope to see you, you know, tonight at the uh, OMSI party. <laughs>